Hello, I'm here to talk to you today about the flood of Noah. You see, Noah's flood was a real event that really happened. There really was a flood that covered the entire earth. There really was a whole race of people and, and, and animals and everything which then had the breath of life that died and perished off the face of this earth. And modern science of today, the so-called modern science, would try to cover that up and try to say that it never even happened. I'm here today to tell you that there's plenty of evidence to back up the fact that Noah's flood actually did happen. Once we establish that the Bible is God's Word, as I've done in the previous episodes, is pointed towards those things to establish that, it's clear that the Bible is God's Word, and He did do what He said He did, and He is going to do what He says He's going to do in the future. So God made a perfect world. That's the one thing that we forget about a lot of times. God made a perfect world put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in this perfect garden and gave them the perfect ideal circumstances for life but they blew it they sinned they turned against God they did what God told them not to do here's a news, a news clipping it says herd of dinosaurs found in bone bed did you know that when we look around the earth today we find all kinds of fossils which are is, is a story of death and destruction. See, all that death and destruction, the Bible says that God created a perfect world, and it was very good. And man brought sin into the world. By sinning, sin brought death into the world. So here we can see, when we look into the fossils around the earth today and the different le uh, things that we dig up, we can tell that there's a, there's a history of some terrible catastrophe happened in this earth. So the question is, if God made a perfect world, and then why did God destroy the world, and what evidence is there for the flood? Well, we can tell from Genesis 6-5, we, we, first we want to start talking about why did God destroy the world. And in Genesis 6-5 it says that, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his, and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. And the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh has corrupted its way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is upon me, is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. You see, God didn't want to destroy his creation, but the earth was filled with violence and wickedness, much like it is filling up today. And we'll get into that a little later. Did you know the Bible speaks of a time when the waters stood above the mountains? In Psalm 104, it says the waters stood above the mountain. And we find that that very thing, when we go to the top of Mount Everest, when people go to the top of Mount Everest, they find marine animals, all kinds of marine life fossilized. That was once on the ocean floor is now on the high mountain. This fits just perfectly with what the Bible has to say. Did you know they find just dense beds of clams that are all in the closed position? Clams open when they die. Why would they be all why would there be a bunch of clams all buried in the closed position? This points towards a global flood. This points towards the flood of Noah right here. Well, oysters eleven and a half feet wide are found two miles above sea level. Two miles above sea level, oysters eleven and a half feet wide. The Bible says in Genesis 7:19 that the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. So this was not just a local flood. This was not just a flood in a certain little region, like a lot of, a lot of times people would uh, postulate. It was a whole world flood, a global flood. Okay, now some people might ask the question, now why would, how would all the water go and cover the whole earth? Well, if the if all the um, 
hills and everything were smoothed out, there would be enough water in the oceans right now to cover the entire Earth a mile and a half deep. As a matter of fact, if the Earth were reduced to a 12-inch globe, all the water in the oceans wouldn't even fill one tablespoon at, this, at a 12-inch globe scale. So it's, once you do the math and you do the construction there, you can see that the water, there's plenty of water to cover the Earth. Now, there, now, a lot of questions might come up about where did all that water come from and where did it go? And, and I've got the excellent video on my website, on the, on the YouTube page here. Um, just click on the playlist tab, go to my uh, YouTube screen name here, Let There Be Light 7777, click on the playlist tab, and there's a Noah's Flood playlist, and look at the hydro plate theory by Walt Brown. That is the perfect explanation for what how all the plates and everything moved around and how the water, where the water came from and where it went, how it went back into the oceans when the waters ran back off. Okay. Genesis 7 verses 11 and 12 said, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the, mount, were all the fountains of the deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. See, most of the water for the flood came from under the crust of the earth, came from up through the fountains of the deep. And then when the water ran back off, Psalm 104 says, they go up by the mountains, down by the valleys. It's old English for the, the mountains arose and the valleys sank down. You see, the crust of the earth is about 30 miles thick under the continent and only three and a half miles thick under the ocean, three to five, three to five miles thick under the ocean. So as the mountains rose up, the valleys sank down, filled with water, called oceans, and water ran off, ca caused tremendous erosion through the soft sediments. You see, when all that water was running off, that is what caused all the water-carved things we see. We see large runoff areas around the earth. Uh, uniformitarian teaching tells us that some of these things took millions and millions of years for for wind and abrasion and dust to cut some things, but really these, a lot of these things was cut really quickly when the water was running off. Um, look at this canyon here, Bryce Canyon. This is, this is where the, obviously water ran off and the flood, Noah's flood waters ran off so fast that it carved this, all these formations here. Now the question is, when you have a formation like this, is this really millions of years of erosion. This picture here is supposedly millions of years of erosion. This next picture looks just like it, but is this millions of years of erosion too? No, this is just the pin on the top right there. You can see that this was just a place where some water rushed across some dirt and caused the exact same looking formation on a small scale. We look all over the place and find huge runoff areas where the water caused these huge draining draining areas to happen. So what it all boils down to is that we have a creationist timeline. According to the Bible view, we have 6,000 years ago, the creation, 4,400 years ago, a flood, and then Jesus' birth, and today. Greatly different than what the evolutionist timeline is. The evolutionist timeline says 20 billion years ago there was a big bang. Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. Life appeared 3 billion. And man appeared 3 million years ago. Greatly different. So let's look at the let's look at some of the time indicators for Noah's flood that was as we see it in the Earth today. Okay, let's look at the Great Barrier Reef. This is the largest coral reef in the world. See, we busted through it with some anchors and bombs and things back in World War II to try to make a flat path for some ships to get through. And after the war was over, scientists came back and watched it grow back for 20 years. And what did they find? Based upon the growth of that, that coral reef that they watched grow back, they, could, they said that that whole entire coral reef is less than 4,200 years old. That fits just fine with the Bible view right there the oldest tree in the world, the Methuselah tree. It is a bristlecone pine tree out in, I believe it's in California. The oldest tree in the world. Here we can see a picture of it in the uh, science textbook here. 
is approximately 4,300 years old. So that fits just fine with the Bible view too. If there would have been a global flood, some of the first trees would have had to arise after that flood, same as the coral reef would have had to start growing after the global cataclysm. Let's look at the Sahara Desert here. The Sahara Desert has a prevailing wind pattern. This is a wind that always blows in the same direction and causes that desert to grow about three and a half miles per year. So as that dry air blows off the desert, it dries out the edge and causes more desert and causes the desert to grow about three and a half miles a year. So if you throw that in reverse, you end up with this desert being about 4,000 years old. Well, that fits just fine with the Bible view, too. It's kind of hard to have a desert under a flood. So the fact that the Sahara Desert could be about 4,000 years old fits just fine with the Bible view. It even points and complements the Noah's flood. We've got the Mississippi River Delta. They've looked at the, the dirt that comes out of that delta, and they said, you know what? There are 80,000 tons of, of dirt and sediments at a rate of uh, 80,000 tons an hour, day after day, year after year, flowing into that delta. But there's a problem. There's only about 30,000 years worth of mud out there, they would say. So how can, if this, if this, all this system is millions and millions of years old, why is there only enough dirt to account for 30,000 years worth of mud? Well, the answer may well be that in the runoff from Noah's flood, a lot of that mud came off of there in a real big hurry when the, when the main runoff was going off. And then what we see today is what's been happening ever since, 80,000 tons an hour. Here's a question. At the current rate of erosion, the continents would erode flat in 14 million years. How can we have rocks 300 times older than that still above sea level? It's another good question if the, uh, for, to try to postulate how could this thing could be millions and millions of years old. Here's a picture of a 30-foot petrified tree going through rock and coal seams at the same time. Well, I thought these were supposedly millions and millions, thousands and thousands of years apart. How could a tree stand upright while the coal formed and then all that other layer formed? You see, they found that coal can be formed by heating wood and clay and water at 150 degrees centigrade for 36 weeks. So coal doesn't take a long, long time to form underneath the ground. It can be formed, all it takes is heat and pressure and a little bit of time and you can have coal. See, when we look in the ground and we see all these dead things and all these fossils and all this thing, all this kind of thing, everything we see in nature should remind us of God's judgment. The hills, the gas, the fossils, the oil, the valleys, sedimentary, sedimentary rocks, layers. See, God left a record of the fact that He hates sin and that God judged the entire earth. So, see, some people ask, well, well, why did God use a flood and not just have all the bad people die? Wouldn't that have been a lot easier, a lot less messy? Wouldn't have had to go to all the trouble of building that ark and having all them animals get on there and all that? Well, here's some things consider, to consider concerning the flood. You see, the flood left as evidence where a miracle would not. When we look at the fossils and all the, de the things buried in these layers, that is evidence of what happened, the evidence that backs up what happened in the Bible. Number two, the evidence is here for all to see and be reminded of God's judgment on sin. God hates sin, and he's, He judged sin, and He's going to judge sin again. He's going to judge everybody's sin. So we need to be aware of this, and we need to see the effects of it so we don't brush it off as like something else happened instead of uh, God's judgment on sin. And number three, the warning time gave them a chance to repent. You see, right now, many of you are during your warning time. We all have a chance to repent. We have this time on the earth to repent and entrust in Christ as our personal Savior. But the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the true image of God, should shine on them. You know the devil is the God of this world, and he doesn't want you to believe in Christ. He doesn't want you to trust Christ. He doesn't want you to believe any of this 
things, that, that these teachings or anything that would come from the Bible, because they point you to God. They point you to Jesus Christ. See, we need to be aware of the scoffers that exist in our day. We need to be aware of the scoffers that, that scoff and scorn at God's Word. Second Peter 3.3 3 points out that in these last days there will be scoffers dismissing things about the Word of God, dismissing things like the flood and, and trying to give him other explanations. Second Peter 3.3 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Well, that sounds a lot like a uniformitarianism teaching that we see today. That, that when we look at the things that are going on, that they're slowly building up those layers, continuing as they were ever since the beginning. They don't want you to believe that all these things were a, a result of God's judgment piled up and stacked up in these layers and death and fossils. Second Peter 3, 5 says, For this they are willingly ignorant of. Willingly ignorant. That means they have to do it on purpose. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth, standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens which and the earth which are now, kept by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. This is very serious, folks. Things are coming to a close. Things are coming to an end in this world. The signs are there, the, the geology and everything points back to what's the past record of these things that are coming on upon the earth in the future, the day of fire. So God promised he would never destroy the earth with water again, but this time it's going to be destroyed with fire. All the melt elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. But these scoffers that we speak of, these scoffers are willingly ignorant of, number one, the creation. They don't want us to believe that there was a creator and that there was a, that he made the creation that we live in. Number two, the flood. The scoffers are willingly ignorant of the flood. They want to deny that there ever was a flood, and if there was, it was some sort of little flood in some little lake somewhere where a city got buried. Number three, the coming judgment. You see, there is a coming judgment. There is going to be a time where we all individually need to answer for our very own sins. And there's no answer we can have that will satisfy God's wrath except for Christ Jesus covering our sins. So, here's a picture of a minivan. Now, I've got a question for you. Why did Chrysler build a crashed-up minivan? Why in the world would Chrysler Company build a smashed-up minivan anyway? Well, you know that's silly. You know that Chrysler built a a normal minivan, and then man smashed it up later. Well, that's exactly what happened to this creation. This creation is a junkyard compared to what it was in the first place. God made a perfect world, made a perfect creation. Man wrecked it. Man wrecked it and has put it in the state that it's in today. But the good news is God's going, there's some times coming, there's a thousand year reign of Christ coming, where things are going to be a whole lot better, and there's a new heavens and a new earth coming after that. According to the Bible, that's going to be a whole lot better. The Bible says in Isaiah 11:6 that the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lamb, lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. That's right. A little child is going to lead a lion and the fatling, wolf, all those, those kind of things. The Bible says in Isaiah 11:7 that the cow and the bear shall feed, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So there's not even going to be gory uh, mess going on between the animals. Okay. And then ultimately in Isaiah 65:17, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, for the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth created. And Isaiah 65, 20 says, For the child shall die in a hundred years old. There's a time where the child shall die even yet a hundred years old. Second Peter 3, 9 tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's God's will that we all 
come to repentance. It's not God's will that any should perish. But as the days of Noah were, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You see, today is just like the day of Noah. In Matthew 24:38, it says, For as in the days of Noah before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. 2 Corinthians 4, or 5, 10 through 11 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. So we need to be ready for it. Okay, let's summarize here and then we'll fit. Number one, God owns the world. Number two, He makes the rules, you know, like the Ten Commandments. And number four, unfortunately, we are guilty of breaking His rules. And, and we must be punished. Or we must find a substitute to take our place. Well, the good news is, Jesus is willing and able. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Have you trusted as Christ as your Lord and Savior? He's waiting. If you died today, where would you go? You see, you're going to be dead for a long time. All you have is a dash between two dates on a rock here on this earth. That, then what you do within that dash, and what you spit, what you do with your time while you're in this dash between two dates on a rock is going to affect your eternity. It's going to, Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves earth, the treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. Thieves do not break in and steal. And this life is nothing but a, a vapor. It's like the, it's there and it's gone. We need to prepare for eternity and be ready for the things that are coming upon our very soul. Well, don't forget I've got a playlist tab here at the top for explanations about Noah's Flood. I'll be adding videos as I find them that, that I believe uh, correlate just the scientific aspects of how Noah's Flood actually happened. And I'll also be adding other playlist tabs for other subjects. Don't forget to post your questions and video responses, anything you have a want to talk about or anything that's on your mind, feel free to post them on here or on my blog. Have a good day.